Hello, I'm Dr. Charles Gardner, Medical Officer of Health at the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, here to provide the COVID-19 update for Simcoe Muskoka. So, um, since I last reported on February the 9th, uh, we've had an additional 207 cases, so that takes us up to 5,993 cases. Uh, this is actually quite a marked reduction since the beginning of January, a 58% reduction overall. At that point, we had our peak number of cases in a week of 494, so down to 207. Um, I would um, like to acknowledge that we've had eight deaths over the past week. And I would like to express my condolences to the family members of these people for your loss. They consist of um, the following people. Uh, um, a woman between the ages of 65 and 79. A man between the ages of 65 and 79. A woman between the ages of 45 and 64. A man who's over 80 years of age. Um, a man who's between 65 and 79 years of age, a woman um, over 80 years of age, a man over 80 years of age, and a woman over 80 years of age. So in the month of February, we've had a total of uh, 21 people who've passed away, who've died, which brings us up to a total of 179 deaths. Um, so therefore up from um, up um, 21 deaths, as I'd said, during the month of February. 84% um, of them have been associated with outbreaks. So, so far this week, we've had 49 cases. And so by this week, I mean through, through, the, through the weekend. Um, so 45 of them were sporadic cases. One was from an institutional outbreak, one from a workplace outbreak, two from congregate settings, um, 29 of them uh, were male and 20 of them female. Their ages range from under 10 to over 80. 47 of them um, were from Simcoe County, uh, are from Simcoe County, and two are from Muskoka. One of them was community acquired, and by that I mean uh, we don't know how they acquired it. Um, six were um, close contacts of known cases, one part of an institutional outbreak, two congregate setting outbreaks, one a workplace outbreak, and 38 under investigation. And all of them are self-isolating. None of them have been hospitalized. <clears throat> we have a total of 666 active cases, which is down from 819. So we have a total of 5,106 cases recovered, which is up uh, from last week at 4,760. We have 23 cases of um, Muskoka Simcoe residents hospitalized, which is down from 33 a week ago. Their ages range from in the teens to in their 90s. All are from Simcoe County Air, and six are, six are in the intensive care unit. So we have individuals who are at RVH, at South Lake, at uh, Collingwood General Marine Hospital, at um, the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, and uh, Toronto General Hospital. The great majority of our cases are in South Simcoe and Barrie, so Barrie and Bradford, West Gwillimbury, New Tecumseh, Innisfil, and Essa. Um, our weekly incidence of cases uh, is uh, reduced. Actually, I don't have the figure in front of me, but I will be getting to it later, but we've got a, a reduction in um, Barrie, so now it's down to 48 cases per 100,000 population per week, which is one third lower than the previous week. And this is the third consecutive week uh, with a large decrease in the weekly incidence among Barrie residents. 
Bradford West Guillenbury has an incidence of 77 cases per 100,000 population. So this, this too is a significant reduction. Uh, we have no municipality in Simcoe Muskoka now with more than 100 cases per 100,000 population per week. So yeah, certainly um, right now we have 22 outbreaks down from 25 a week ago. So six are in long-term care facilities, four are in retirement homes, three are in hospitals. Two of the three are in uh, one hospital, RVH. Um, one is in a congregate setting. Um, six are in workplaces, one is in a community setting, and uh, one is in an educational setting. <clears throat> So if we look at some of the details on this, the 12 institutional outbreaks, uh, new ones are as follows, uh, Barry Manor Retirement Home, so only one new one, and then two declared over, Trillium Manor and Mill Creek Care Center in Barry. We have um, one outbreak in a congregate setting, which is unchanged. We have six outbreaks in a workplace, which is down from eight so a new one in a manufacturing location in Simcoe County and three declared over a manufacturing setting in Simcoe County and two agricultural settings in Simcoe County. We have one outbreak in a community setting, which is unchanged, and one outbreak in an educational setting, uh, which is down from two a week ago. So no new outbreaks. And the outbreak that had been at Bear Creek Secondary School is declared over. So um, some information about UK variants of concern, such as, or sorry, I should say the COVID-19 variants of concern, such as the UK variant. So um, with this situation, there are the variants, and then there's a screening test to determine if we probably are dealing with a variant. And in those situations, there's a follow-up test time uh, by the public health laboratory system to identify which variant we're dealing with. And so far in Simcoe, Muskoka, we've only had um, the UK variant identified to date, or we have screen positive individuals waiting identification for the type. Um, so no other variants have been discovered here as yet. Uh, so uh, in total, we've had 153 individuals who have tested tested positive for the uh, B117 variant, the UK variant. So this is up from 133 a week ago. Um, and we have 131 individuals who've screened positive for the mutation that is um, likely to be shown to be a, a variant such as the UK variant. And that's up from 64 a week ago. Um, we've also had 123 negative results um, for uh, testing for variants of concern. So it's important to know that um, we have many more individuals who are part of outbreaks where um, the UK variant has been identified. And in those situations, um, although we don't get test results necessarily in all of those cases, um, I consider that it's very likely that all of the um, COVID cases associated with those outbreaks, in fact, are the UK variants. So we actually have more cases that um, have not been tested that probably are the UK variant. Um, so uh, just to get into some of the specifics, we have three institutional outbreaks that have the B117 variant, the UK variant, and another four institutions that have tested positive for the screen um, the mutation and are awaiting further testing to see which variant it is. Um, so uh, a total of seven institutions that have some kind of a variant uh, of um, COVID-19. So Roberta Place is one of the institutions with the UK variant. They've had a total of 87 positive test results uh, for the UK variant, uh, which is up from 85 a week ago. And we have 20 other individuals in that outbreak who tested positive for the screening test awaiting confirmation about what type they have. Uh, and uh, other test results uh, submitted and awaiting results. Uh, Bradford Valley, a care community, have nine 
test positive cases of the UK variant, B117 variant, which is unchanged from a week ago. They have six other individuals who have screened positive and are awaiting confirmation as to which variant it is. But as I've indicated in these outbreaks, I consider that all COVID positive individuals um, are going to be, if they are tested, they'll be identified to be um, the UK variant. Uh, so they, like I said, six um, screen positives, would, which is up from four a week ago. Uh, Waypoint um, Mental Health Center have 11 cases of the UK variant, B117, which is up from two a week ago. And they have another six individuals um, who have screened positive. So that's actually down. There had been 12. It's down to six, which means six of them went on, were screened, uh, and found to be positive for the UK variant. So they're no longer just screen positive, they're, they're um, confirmed to be the UK variant. IOOF in Barrie has one test positive individual for the screen, um, the mutation awaiting confirmation as to which subtype it is, which variant it is. Uh, Barry Manor uh, Retirement Home has had one screen positive individual. Simcoe Manor uh, has had one screen positive individual. And Georgian Traditions has uh, one screen positive individual. We also have other institutions in which we've had um, individuals test positive for the UK variant, so three. Um, Sorry, I'm just uh, checking my notes here again. I, I'm gonna have to uh, revise that. I've already spoken to the institutions. I'm just going on now to uh, other locations of concern. So we have some non-institutional outbreaks, a total of five um, that have either um, the, uh, the UK variant identified or a variant of concern screen positive. So. Uh, an apartment complex in Simcoe uh, County, one individual testing positive for the UK variant and 14 uh, screen positive individuals awaiting confirmation as, as to the type of variant. Um, we have a, a retail location. We have two individuals who tested positive for the UK variant. I've um, spoken to this uh, particular location before as well as the um, apartment complex. Uh, emergency services location in Simcoe County has one individual testing positive for the UK variant and uh, another individual um, who is out of jurisdiction um, who is also testing positive for the UK variant. We have a manufacturing location in Simcoe County that had three individuals testing positive for the screen, the mutation, uh, awaiting confirmation as to which variant it is. We have a finance and insurance facility in Simcoe County that has tested positive for the screen, awaiting confirmation as to which subtype it is. And beyond that, we also have sporadic cases in the community. So we have two individuals who've tested positive for the UK variant that aren't associated with any institution or outbreak. And I've reported on this before, but we've now also got 54 individuals in the community who are screen positive for the mutation of concern, uh, suggesting they have a, a variant of concern awaiting confirmation as to which type of variant they have. So 54. One of those individuals resides in Muskoka. The others reside in Simcoe County. So this is the first time we've had some indication of a variant of concern, probably, because this is a screen test, awaiting confirmation, but probably a variant of concern in Muskoka. Um, okay, so um, I will be talking a little later about the details of the outbreaks. Uh, so with regards to COVID-19 vaccination, uh, we continue to work closely with RVH and the city of Barrie and Simcoe County uh, in order to provide, provide immunization uh, to priority groups in, in Simcoe Muskoka throughout all of Simcoe Muskoka uh, at um, uh, the pace that we can 
given the supply coming to us from uh, the province, federally sourced and, and from the province. So at this point, we have vaccinated over 28,000 individuals. Um, this is up 6,000 from last week. 92% um, of those, 92% of long-term care residents are now immunized. So this is up from 90% a week ago. And 69% um, of residents in retirement homes um, have been immunized up from 65% a week ago. Uh, those individuals having received their first, first dose of immunization. Uh, so if we go to uh, priority groups, we've also immunized over 5,000 um, long-term care and retirement home staff and essential caregivers, giving them their first dose. Uh, and um, of those, over 3,000 have received their second dose. Uh, this is up um, by uh, over a thousand from last week. There were just over 2,000 that were immunized a week ago. We've immunized 5,400 healthcare workers in hospitals uh, and also residents uh, within alternate level of care locations in hospitals, so chronic care in, in hospitals, have received their first dose. Um, and this is unchanged from a week ago. Um, and we've also had uh, 5,000 individuals who received their second dose of, the, of the, that grouping of, of healthcare workers and um, residents of alternate level care, uh, which is up from 2,400 a week ago. Uh, we, um, have provided, um, 2,700 residents with their of uh, long-term care facilities with their second dose as well. So the, the, uh, the great majority of uh, residents in long-term care facilities have received their, their, both of their doses at this time. And um, uh, we look forward to being able to provide immunization to the remaining uh, uh, residents of retirement homes. We are proceeding with providing immunization to the retirement homes as well. To this point, we've immunized those um, in the higher risk homes, but our intention is to uh, go ahead and finish providing immunization to the residents of all of the retirement homes by the 27th of February. In terms of our dashboard, not the province's framework, but our dashboard, we remain in red alert status. Um, viral containment and spread continues um, at a red level, even though um, we've actually had a reduction in um, our weekly cases. Uh, laboratory testing remains in yellow uh, with um, a one-day turnaround time of 47.6% of our test results, uh, the goal being greater than 60%. Our percent positivity is down to 1.9% uh, from 2.2 last week, which is a good thing. That's an indication of um, uh, how prevalent the virus is in our community and how many people are getting uh, tested. Um, healthcare system capacity remains at yellow uh, with ICU bed occupancy uh, nearing the goal of, of less than 90% uh, um, uh, occupancy. So it's, uh, the issue there is um, we, we don't wanna go above 90% or that would put us in a red category. At this point, it's 80.8%. 80, 80 and um, public health, the public health system capacity is in red uh, because of the um, limited, or limited ability to be able to get to people uh, within 24 hours of notification as cases in order to follow up with them. We're improving on that as our case count comes down. So we're now at 87.9%, if you were just, just below the goal of 90%. So there is some improvement overall, though we still remain in red status. Uh, this, once again, is our own, um, our own dashboard, not the province's framework. And I'll be speaking, uh, I think, a little bit later about um, the province's framework and where we sit on that framework. In terms of our trajectory of cases, so our weekly incidence 
is down to 22.9 cases per 100,000 population. Uh, last week it was 47.8, so that's a dramatic drop, dropping in half of what it had been the week before. So certainly that's very good. And the province too has come down uh, and they remain um, slightly over twice the incidence that we have at 53.3 cases per 100,000 population per week. And that's where we've been riding all along, about half of what the provincial rate has been. Uh, and considerably less than the rate of the municipalities to the south of us in the range of a quarter of um, the incidence of those municipalities. Uh, our reproduction number is 1.0, so we like it to be below 1 uh, as an indication that it is shrinking, the pandemic coming under control. And our double, doubling time is increased now to four months, which um, uh, is, is certainly good to see. Um, if I look at the provincial dashboard and how our numbers fare, like the, at this point the province has indicated that we are in red uh, status and um, uh, this would be in part um, due to my own positioning. Uh, that we need to be cautious with the, the variants of concern, considering that we have a you know, very high number of variants of concern here, that they are more contagious, that there's a potential for a more rapid spread of those variants, potentially the UK variant also being more virulent, um, having a more severe impact on people. Um, and so um, my recommendation was uh, red. Uh, and that it'd be for our district because we have the potential for it to also spread into Muskoka. I, I acknowledge that Muskoka's rates are quite a bit lower than Simcoe, um, but I'm concerned about the potential for spread and I still feel that it's very important that people abide as much as they can by a stay-at-home approach. Going to red means it's no longer an order, but it is definitely um, a strong recommendation from the province, even for all of the, the color locations, that. Um, you stay at home and you go out only for essential purposes and that you only travel for essential purposes as well. So um, that's the, the location that we're at right now in terms of province's de designation. But if we actually look at our numbers, um, we, I see that in fact for Simcoe Muskoka as a whole, um, they're divided between orange and green and yellow. Um, and uh, red for uh, outbreak trend uh, and observations, and also with regards to uh, public health system capacity is in red. Um, but otherwise, um, I would acknowledge that uh, our, our, our yeah, incidence of cases is, is low enough um, that we're definitely being precautionary by being in red status. So um, just going to reflect on our outbreaks and provide some detail and these outbreaks are listed in uh, order of when they were declared. Uh, so we have an ongoing outbreak at Lakeside Retirement Residence which was declared on December the 26th with two staff cases uh, which is unchanged. We have 92% um, of the residents immunized which is very good for protection. Uh, Grove Park long-term care facility in Barrie has two resident cases and um, those are new since I last reported. This is an outbreak declared on January the 4th and we have 13 staff cases which is unchanged uh, and 97% of the residents in that facility are immunized. Roberta Place long-term care facility. Um, we are actually very close to having that outbreak declared over. Uh, the onset of the most recent case um, in which an individual was on the premises while they had their onset um, was the 3rd of February, and we usually go 14 night days out into the future, so we're very close to calling that outbreak over. And considering just what a, a truly tragic outbreak that has been, that, that's a good thing to get to that point. Um, certainly a lot of work had to go into achieving that. And uh, as always, I'd like to um, 
acknowledge the loss of um, so many of the residents and the family members for your loss. So we've had 70 deaths at that facility. This is up by one over the past week um, among the residents. So 67 of them are from confirmed cases and three are from probable cases, cases uh, for which a test wasn't actually done, but they've met the case definition otherwise with their um, presentation. Uh, we have uh, 129 resident cases, so all but one of the uh, residents has a case, which is unchanged over the past week. We have 89 positive staff cases, which is up by two over the past week, um, but uh, no exposure in the facility um, during their period of communicability, so it doesn't affect um, you know, the, the point at which um, we had last had uh, a case at the, at the facility, the, the 3rd of February. We've had 17 um, uh, redeployed staff from other facilities that have been cases, which is up from uh, by two uh, over the last week. Uh, we've had um, seven external uh, partner cases, which is unchanged over the last week. And we've had five essential visitors as cases up by one over the past week. And as I've indicated before, there was a death among one of the essential visitors. Um, going on to uh, Royal Victoria Hospital, they've got um, two locations in, in their facility right now that remain in outbreak. So they had an outbreak uh, declared on their ISU, um, which is now uh, declared over on January the 30th, and an outbreak on their transitional care unit, uh, which is declared over on the 14th. And so they have an outbreak on their specialized senior care unit. It was declared on January the 28th. Uh, they've uh, had a um, total of uh, 11 deaths, so this is up by two from uh, a week ago, and 24 cases among their patients, which is unchanged, and 26 cases among the staff, which is unchanged over the past week. Um, and they have another uh, location uh, within the facility that's outbreak that I will speak to in a moment. Uh, Bradford Valley Care Community uh, has an outbreak declared on January the 14th with um, the UK variant and have had two deaths, which is unchanged over the past week. A total of seven cases among staff, which, which is up by one over the past week, and 15 cases among residents, which is unchanged. And 97% of the residents are, are now immunized. Uh, Waypoint Center for Mental Health um, have had um, the UK variant identified on their premises and have had seven deaths. So this is up by two among their residents over the past week. And have had 14 positive staff cases, which is up by two over the last week, and 17 um, uh, patient cases, which is up by one over the past week. Amica Little Lake Retirement uh, Facility in Barrie had an outbreak declared on January the 30th. They have two positive staff cases, which is unchanged, and 90% of their residents are immunized. Georgia Manor, uh, in Penetanguishene, had an outbreak declared on February the 1st with two staff cases, which is unchanged over the past week, no resident cases, and 94% of their residents have been immunized. Simcoe Manor in Beaton, outbreak declared on February the 5th, a staff uh, case uh, testing positive for um, the 
mutation that is a screening test for a variant of concern awaiting confirmation testing as to which variant. And uh, so we have two staff cases, which is unchanged over the past week, no resident cases, and 82% of the residents there are vaccinated. Um, Royal Victoria Regional Health Center's um, second uh, outbreak location um, that's active at this time is on their cancer and palliative care unit, and that was declared on February the 5th. They have two positive patient cases, which is unchanged, and one positive staff case. Georgian Traditions Retirement Home in Collingwood de declared as an outbreak February the 7th, and they have um, a staff case which is positive for the variant of concern, or the mutation that um, is a screening test for a variant of concern, and uh, we are awaiting confirmatory tests as to which variant it is. So one positive staff case, no resident cases, and 98% of the residents have received their immunization. Barry Manor Retirement Home in Barry outbreak declared on February the 10th. One positive staff case, no positive resident cases, and 92% of the residents have been immunized. In terms of educational setting outbreaks, we have one, which is at a child care center in Barrie, with nine positive staff cases, and I we don't differentiate differentiate in school settings and in um, daycare settings, child care settings, staff cases from resident cases because of the small numbers of potential to identify individuals to protect privacy. So, nine positive uh, cases that. Um, has not changed over the past week. We have uh, one um, outbreak in a congregate setting, a group home in Simcoe County, declared on February the 4th with a positive staff member. We have um, a community uh, setting outbreak in um, Simcoe County, a, a real estate rental and leasing location, a, an apartment complex in Simcoe County. Uh, and that outbreak is associated with um, the UK variant, one positive test for the UK variant and 10 uh, positive tests for um, the mutation um, that is a screening test for a variant of concern. And uh, a total of 25 cases of COVID-19 uh, associated with that outbreak, which is up by one over the past week. And uh, um, testing has been provided for all individuals in that, uh, in that complex with uh, negative test results otherwise coming back. Uh, workplace outbreaks, we have six. So a food processing facility in Simcoe County with 21 positive staff, which is up by two over the past week. And uh, testing otherwise having been conducted on the premises. Uh, we have a finance and insurance location outbreak declared February the 1st. Uh, this is associated with the screening test mutation for a variant of concern and awaiting confirmation as to which variant it is. So we have. Um, six positive staff as a part of that outbreak. So that was declared February the 1st. Um, a retail location in Simcoe County outbreak declared February the 2nd uh, with seven staff. I beg your pardon, three staff cases. Uh, a finance and insurance uh, facility in Simcoe County declared on February the 2nd with three staff cases. A food premise in Simcoe County declared as an outbreak February the 6th with three staff as cases. A manufacturing facility in Simcoe County declared as an outbreak February the 10th. And two of the cases um, have tested positive for the mutation that is a screening test for a variant of concern awaiting confirmation as to which variant. Uh, so five um, staff cases in total. So, I'll 
just turn to my media notes. So I've already identified that Simcoe County as of today is in um, the red control classification by the province. Uh, and this does um, require substantial restrictions, although um, it is a movement towards an opening of uh, businesses and uh, services, but uh, substantially restricted, but definitely an opening compared with the shutdown. Um, and I would like to emphasize that we still heavily advise, I still heavily advise that people abide by a stay-at-home approach, that you stay at home and you only go out for essential purposes, and that would be um, to shop for food or other essential items, um, to um, including medication, to seek medical care, to attend work, to attend school, to uh, get physical activity. Um, and that also you restrict your travel to be for essential purposes as well. Uh, this is important to help contain spread of COVID-19 and then uh, the UK variant of COVID-19 in our district. It's now uh, very important that people continue to abide by this approach uh, and to otherwise exercise the other precautions when you are out physical distancing from other people, not having people over to your home, not going over to other people's homes, um, and the only exception being for those who live alone and in that case adopting only one other household for you, you to um, have that kind of contact with people and to use face coverings when in indoor public settings, uh, work settings, uh, maintaining the physical distancing, hand hygiene, uh, self-monitoring and self-isolation and seeking medical attention and testing if you develop symptoms. All of that's really important and is all of in my opinion, that's going to be important throughout the pandemic until we really get control of things um, to come with immunization. And that will take us months to achieve. Uh, we do have information on our website about the details of uh, red status and um, what that would mean for individuals and what that would mean for businesses. And are happy to take phone calls and inquiries about that. Um, I've issued another order under the Health Protection and Promotion Act to those attending long-term care homes uh, in order to require those homes to be adding an additional screen to um, people who are going to be going to be visiting or working at entering those those premises um, and that is that they would not allow individuals who have somebody at their home who is presently ill, symptomatic, uh, with symptoms compatible with COVID-19. So it's an added precaution. It's not just that if you have somebody at home who's diagnosed with COVID-19, if, if you have somebody at home who have symptoms that are possibly, possibly due to COVID-19, um, that uh, you would not uh, be allowed into uh, the premises of a long-term care facility until that's sorted out, until that's investigated properly. So that's an added level of protection. These homes now are um, putting in place, um, now or in the very near future, uh, rapid testing as well for individuals coming into the homes in order to uh, um, get a, a, a negative result. So that's an, an added level of protection. Certainly vaccination is an added level of protection and I'm very happy that we've been able to immunize um, in our long-term care facilities in many of our uh, retirement homes and we'll be completing immunization of at least first dose for the uh, retirement homes um, by the uh, 27th. So um, I've already spoken to our vaccination rollout. Um, and uh, one thing I would say is that we're planning actively for when there would be more vaccine to come. Uh, so we continue to have a limited supply of vaccine. We are planning with our community partners, um, uh, primary care providers, family health teams, Ontario health teams, hospitals, pharmacies, uh, EMS, um, for community mass immunization clinics throughout Simcoe, Muskoka. Uh, to have them come online in March uh, and to have at least one of these in each of our six sub-regions throughout Simcoe Muskoka. So when that comes into place, 
we'd be ready for uh, what we have been told will be a much greater supply of vaccine coming in March uh, so that we'd be able to provide that much more volume of vaccine closer to where people live. Um, and we're also planning on um, what we'll do from now until March and um, also of course what we'll do in terms of priority groups to follow in March. But the, the province has issued um, uh, information uh, about priority populations. A, a letter of instruction came uh, from the province on the weekend um, that was really a continuation of the information we've been receiving all the way along, uh, more of a refinement as to uh, who would be priority next. And between now and March, uh, we certainly want to continue vaccinating in our retirement homes, continue vaccinating the um, for the second dose for those that are in long-term care and retirement homes and also um, the staff of long-term care facilities of retirement homes of hospitals and the essential care caregivers for uh, the retirement homes and the, the, uh, the long-term care facilities so uh, those groups we want to continue with <clears throat> we're interested certainly in moving on to other priority groups we'd be very much interested in um, those who um, work as paramedics, those who work in assessment centers, fa the patient-facing workers of, a, of uh, the assessment centers, and our First Nations communities. So um, looking to the near future, um, that, that is what we have in mind, what we have on the horizon. We're very aware that the province has moved um, to identify older individuals, people above 80, as being a very important priority group to receive immunization. And um, that's certainly something we concur with because they are at the highest risk of a severe outcome from infection, including death, over 25% mortality rates on a case-by-case -case basis for those above 80. Um, and we would be looking uh, in March uh, to be in a position to be able to start with that. We have to work out how we would um, identify and communicate and book uh, these individuals and we, we may very well be working closely with their primary care provider to assist with that but we have to work that we have to work that out and then there are other community health care providers those who work in other settings in the community who are health care providers who would be priority as well to to receive vaccine or those who provide home care or be priority to receive vaccine so we'd be looking down you know, into, into um, you know, the near future, into March, uh, to be able to commence with that and be able to commence with that better when we have the, the greater capacity of having these um, mass immunization clinics and in, uh, in settings throughout Simcoe Muskoka to be able to do all of that. So a lot, a lot of preparation underway, but things are coming along. Uh, we've had questions about mask use, the questions about what's the ideal approach to wearing a mask, uh, questions about whether or not people should be using two masks, considering that that idea has come up and there are some advocates for that, including in the United States. At this point in time, we're, we're sticking with the recommendations from Public Health Ontario and the Public Health um, Agency of Canada. Uh, which is for a single good quality mask, three-layered, uh, fitting tightly around the edges of your face, covering your nose, mouth, and chin um, as being uh, the ideal. Um, certainly have to be able to breathe well through it if you have um, two masks on. Or it, there may be problematic with that. Um, and at this time, um, we continue to learn. I found that our recommendations over time have evolved as we've learned more. So some questions uh, from the media. What kind of vaccine supply do you expect to get this week and next? Uh, who's on deck to get their shots? I've already spoken to who I would view as coming in the very near future. And we expect to have enough of a supply to be able to uh, provide um, immunization for those groups. I'm not going to give these precise amount because it can shift from week to week. What we're told can change and also because we were originally told it, um, uh, that it's a security hazard to be giving out uh, that, that kind of information in advance but I would say we have enough to um, be able to 
provide for the groups, the priority groups that I've identified over the, the next two weeks to come. Uh, where do paramedics fall in line in the priority list of healthcare workers? Why haven't they already been done as part of the early rollout like those in York Region and many of them in Peel? So what I would say is that they're very high priority. In my mind, they would be among those coming next. Um, and um, uh, the reason why we've not been able, I would actually have to say that we've actually immunized a fair number of paramedics. Those who've been assisting us with immunization have uh, largely been provided with the uh, immunization or had the opportunity to be able to, uh, to get immunization. Um, and so a fair number have already received immunization that way, but um, we didn't receive as much vaccine as early as these other regions to the south of us. The province originally considered them to be harder to hit locations and therefore priority to get their vaccine sooner and in um, a larger quantity and to also get the Moderna vaccine which we didn't get. We've only been getting the Pfizer vaccine. So uh, because of that, we focused on those most vulnerable to get the immunization, and that's been hospital workers and uh, residents and staff and essential caregivers in long-term care facilities and retirement homes, uh, including two homes um, on uh, uh, First Nation community in Simcoe, Muskoka. Uh, Rama of uh, Rama First Nations. So we um, we've prioritized in particular the residents of those facilities because they're a much higher risk of severe outcomes. Uh, that's where we've seen uh, the great majority of our mortality over the pandemic in outbreaks in these facilities. So uh, we we've focused there with the vaccine we have. Um, we haven't had as much of it as they've had to the south of us, so therefore in the south they've been able to also provide immunization to paramedics, and we anticipate being able to do so in the very near future. Um, when will seniors not living in assisted living or long-term care receive their shots, and how will that work? How will they be notified? So I touched on this already, starting with those above 80. Um, and we'd be looking to March, not sure exactly how early in March, but March, using um, the um, mass vaccination clinics that we'd be setting up in each of the six regions. And we do need to identify exactly how best to notify them of this and to be able to book them. And one possibility is working through the, their family practices to assist, but we need to work that out. Um, it, I would like to say that's actually a large population. There's some just under 30,000 people in Simcoe, Muskoka who are 80 and above. And um, so hence we would need a good volume of vaccine and we need all of those locations to be able to service them in this way and also at the same time provide uh, immunization for community healthcare workers, other priority groups. Um, many other cities have a tentative plan for mass vaccination sites, even drive-throughs. What's the plan for Simcoe and Muskoka and how will it work? So I've touched on this to some degree and um, we do anticipate having some uh, detailed plans for each of the sites, exactly which site it would be and how it would operate throughout Simcoe Muskoka, but throughout you know, at least one for each of the six locales of the six sub-regions in Simcoe Muskoka. We, um, we expect that to be submitted to us tomorrow and that'll be incorporated in our overall plan. We have a um, advisory committee meeting coming up on next Monday, the 22nd of uh, February, in which we'll be looking at the revised plan. And um, I um, intend for us to get up a version of that plan um, following that meeting, if not sooner. Uh, so that it would be accessible for people to see. Um, how can we say that we are in red with the variant in the community? What is your biggest concern as we slowly open up? So I would say that the, the UK variant in large numbers, <clears throat> large numbers of individuals here, probably in the range of 500 people anyway, that we, that we uh, can identify um, through the testing, either of those that are um, UK variant positive or um, have a variant of concern positive screening test 
or are uh, COVID positive but are, are definitely part of an outbreak with the UK variant it equals a large number of people. Um, many of those cases now have recovered, majority probably actually if you look at the number and the time might have been recovered, but we continue to see new situations, new exposure locations. Um, the more than 50 individuals who've got this positive screen result who are unlinked to any kind of a, an outbreak or location, that that's of concern to me. Uh, this is a, a more transmissible uh, form of COVID-19 and potentially more um, severe, more virulent. Uh, and uh, so um, to me, it's really important that people abide by the stay-at-home approach I indicated a week ago that the province was taking a risk by moving out of the stay-at-home order and that I prefer, I would have preferred that they continue with the stay-at-home order. Uh, to me, it was central to our communication strategy to the community about reducing the risk of transmission by staying at home. If we reduce uh, how much interaction we have in the community, how much interpersonal interaction and how much travel we do, we reduce the potential for transmission and spread in the community. And we really need to do that. We, The numbers right now otherwise are very favorable. We're um, probably below the red level overall, but uh, with the new variant very active in the community, in my mind that takes us up to at least red. And I would very much prefer that the province in fact have kept the stay-at-home order in place. And um, Mathematical projections, uh, modeling done by the science table for uh, the province for COVID um, predicts that uh, the new variant will continue, or variants, there's more than one of them in the province now, will continue to become more prevalent, uh, will become more prevalent eventually, uh, fairly quickly, in fact, by March, um, then um, the uh, a standard COVID variant and uh, could very well lead to a resurgence of cases, a new, a new wave. So I'd, I would advise the, the province that they be fully prepared to put back in place a stay-at-home order and a shutdown uh, with uh, the onset of a third wave, if not sooner. So uh, why, <clears throat> sorry, will you consider putting in restrictions in place to stop out of area people from still under stay-at-home orders from coming here to use our services similar to Hastings Prince Edward um, Health Unit. So certainly I um, uh, was impressed that that medical officer of health had taken a bold action like that. Um, this is an area of the province that is uh, green, a uh, very low um, uh, incidence of cases and therefore in green status with a very low restrictions and that would be an attraction to people that are still in shutdown to uh, defy their stay-at-home order and to travel to that area and potentially could lead to transmission so I could see uh, the rationale for that the reason why he wanted to do that um, I would note that with the wording of his order if in fact the remaining um, health units are, are still in a stay-at-home order, come out of that order in a week, that um, he, in fact, his, his order would cease to have an impact. It would no longer be effective. And um, in my mind, um, that would be one reason why I wouldn't be considering taking on that, that approach to an order. Uh, instead, I would be, um, at this point, advising the province they be prepared to put in place a stay-at-home order. Um, if not now, then in uh, the future, if there's any, any uh, upswing at all in cases. Um, and um, I, uh, that otherwise, I'm advising members of the public that they abide by that. I've already advised in the past that municipalities not allow services that are non-essential to be provided in their facilities to people from um, the more heavily affected parts of the province to the south of us, and I continue to advise that they abide by that approach. Uh, we had been warned to wash everything as well as washing our hands. Do we know any more on how COVID is transmitted and how long the virus can survive on surfaces? So um, this 
virus can survive on some surfaces is up to 72 hours, um, but it is actually most commonly transmitted through droplet spread inhaled into the airway uh, or potentially from touching surfaces and then your eyes or mouth. Uh, and so um, the hand washing would be key with regards to avoiding that approach to transmission, that means of transmission. Otherwise, um, it's all about distancing or most really basic of all, stay at home or using masks if you're out um, and um, are in an indoor location or you cannot maintain distancing even when outdoors. Um, it's generally been a, just a good long-standing public health practice to wash surfaces to um, certainly in facilities they need to be maintaining that kind of touch surface sanitation uh, as part of their standard approach. Same with work environments, we have that as part of our requirements, my letter of instruction to work environments. Washing food has always been an important public health practice no matter which pathogen you're talking about. Um, but um, on the whole, the, the, the main thing is actually the respiratory route of exposure and the, the need to, to uh, avoid that kind of exposure with distancing, masking and staying at home. Hand washing is always good. Um, what, uh, where are the rapid tests and why aren't they already being used in schools and large workplaces and factories? Um, the Minister of Education just put out a communique today indicating an expectation that we would be, uh, the schools would be, uh, the boards would be looking at testing up to 5% of schools. Um, uh, on a routine basis, they work with public health locally to identify what would be priority for this. As a health unit, we are most focused on um, access to testing in outbreak situations or exposure situations in, in schools as we've been all the way along um, and are uh, happy to work with the schools to identify how else they would use rapid testing. Uh, but we need to f actually work through it with them and figure out exactly what the best approach would be um, for this. And as for um, large employers at this time, certainly there's um, long-term care facilities, uh, which are an important environment for screening, and that's uh, going in place. As for other employers, they've got many other requirements for uh, workplace safety from a COVID point of view. Uh, the screening of employees with regards to questions about their symptoms, self-screening of employees before they go into work and not going in if they have symptoms. Certainly if they have a household um, member who is a COVID case, by standing order from myself, they're required to isolate. Um, and uh, there's a whole host of work environment requirements facilitating distancing and barriers and mask use. Um, and uh, sanitation of surfaces that all remain. Work from home where possible uh, remains, um, but uh, at this point in time, we don't have a comprehensive approach for workplace testing or rapid testing. So that, that remains an area that um, is not a, a, a standard, uh, standard of practice. Um, and then uh, where are the rapid tests and why aren't they already being in? Yeah, we already, already talked about that. So um, what is a high risk retirement home? So um, uh, homes are identified as being high risk based on an assessment done by the retirement home regulatory authority uh, with additional factors included in their assessment process. And these including include whether or not they have a memory care unit, so like a unit for demented uh, residents, and whether or not they are co-located with a long-term care facility. Uh, if they're co-located, the long-term care facilities are at higher risk of uh, having an outbreak and therefore by being co-located, um, a retirement home would also be put at a higher risk. So the Ministry of Health has identified uh, 19 retirement homes as in our area as being at high risk. Um, and uh, we have a total of 53 retirement homes in our area and we've immunized 37 of those homes, uh, the, the residents of those homes. Okay, so 
that brings me to the end of um, my notes. I'd be happy to take questions at this time. I, I, uh, don't, I don't think I will be for the sake of protection of privacy. I would just say that all individuals who would have been in contact with that uh, person have been contacted and notified. We're, we have augmented our approach now with case and contact management because of the new variant. We've gone back to following up with all contacts of cases ourselves. Uh, and because we've had a reduction in the number of cases, we're able to get to people sooner. But at this point in time, I wouldn't be giving more information. That's fine. Could you okay. just uh, maybe just say, do you suspect that it's the UK or one of the other variants? It's much more likely to be the UK variant because that's, A, that's all we've had here. And that's been the great majority of the variants of concern in Ontario to date. Okay, thanks. That's fine. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Happy to take another questioner. Well, my apologies, I was on mute. James Bowler from Kojiko. Are you with us, James? Okay, Allison Brownlee, please, from Muskoka. Yes, thank you. Um, following up on these uh, potential single variant cases in Muskoka and not being able to provide information for privacy reasons. What approach would you like the community to take, um, not knowing in which community this very potential variant may be found? I think that people need to make the assumption that um, there could be a variant of concern, the UK variant, in any community in throughout Simcoe Muskoka now. Um, what we see with uh, surveillance is always the tip of the iceberg, and there's usually much more beneath the surface than what we know. When we detect something, that means it's there, there's more of it. People need to take the precautions, they need to take to heart my advice, uh, the standard advice about stay at home and go out for essential purposes only. And when you do go out, use all the precautions, the distancing, the masking, the hand hygiene uh, that, we, um, that we advise. likelihood of uh, arriving in Muskoka, if it is confirmed in future. Um, and it, I also note that there was some frustration with some members of the community, specifically on social media in our case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also link that to some of the very concerning uh, news we've heard out of Niagara region when it came to um, some very select members of the public and their response to public health officials. Uh, what has your team been experiencing I would say that this has been an incredibly hard time for all of us for many reasons. Uh, certainly for those who've lost a loved one or had to have a difficult recovery from COVID-19, but also really hard for the rest of us because of the restrictions on our lives, because of the impact on our work, because of the impact on our income, uh, because of the greatly reduced ability to see loved ones and parents and grandchildren and friends, and that this is really hard on our mental health and well-being, as well as just the quality of our lives, um, that uh, it's, we're tired of it, everybody's tired of it, um, I am tired of it, um, and, and it's going to go on for a long time yet. Uh, it's going to take us months before we get to the point where we've immunized the great majority of people in the community. and. Um, that people will feel much more secure again and hopefully be able to relax many or most of their precautions. Um, I, I, I think um, that for those reasons, there'll be people who will become angry and um, might become, um, uh, you know, very angry indeed and feel threatened. There'll be some, there are some people who 
feel that this is overblown, that this is not real, uh, that the precautions are unnecessary or excessive. Um, that is certainly a, a reaction that um, we encounter in the community. There are certainly people who feel that way. It is part of a uh, democratic society that we have free and open discussion about what's needed. Uh, and I would always encourage that. And I've certainly received communications from people who um, are opposed to what we're doing for a variety of reasons, uh, restrictions on their freedoms. Um, that is normal, that is natural, that is to be uh, encouraged really in a, a free and democratic society, but what is not acceptable is threats against people's bodily well-being. Um, and uh, there have been instances that I've read of in the media uh, of that happening. We've had um, certainly people express anger to us uh, and uh, we get a lot of communication from people about what, what uh, you know, really what uh, do these restrictions mean and, and you know, how, how can they work with them and their businesses and what a negative impact this is having on their businesses. So. I, I, um, I guess I need to acknowledge all of that and to say that in the end, we really are in this together. We really do need to work through this together. We um, have learned what it takes to control um, the pandemic. We've seen the success that we've had with the shutdown and the stay at home order, a great reduction in the incidence of cases after many months of cases just increasing over time. So we know that works um, and um, we're having success with immunization. We, I, I, I feel confident that that will work too. We need to continue to work together in, in those positive directions uh, so that uh, we can come out of this in a better place later in the year, um, uh, healthier, better, uh, position in, a, in our lives, but we need to work on it together. So I sympathize with people, but I would ask that people um, find it within themselves to be able to continue on this journey together. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and all the work you've been doing today. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to Ian McLennan from Barry 363. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, you may mention of uh, Max so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, probably beginning in March. You talked about, I guess, six sub-regions or six locations. Mm -hmm. um, would this include the next priority population that the province made mention of on the weekend? And there was talk over the weekend in York Region about Canada's Wonderland Market Fairgrounds. When you say location, what sort of location would be ideal for this type of mass vaccination? And would it be the next priori priority population? So to some degree, I've already talked about priority populations. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think in terms of what will we do over the next couple of weeks with uh, the one clinic and the outreach teams that we have versus what would we like to do once we get into having multiple locations. Because um, once you have multiple locations and once you have a lot more vaccine coming, you can open it up much more and start to take in large groups like you know, community health care providers is a very large group. People above the age of 80 is a really large group. So um, we will be in a better position to be able to do that when we've got lots of vaccine and when we've got all of those sites up. To me, the ideal sites um, are, they're going to be varied to some degree. Uh, and there is a potential for drive-throughs as an option. I'm aware of at least uh, two locations where that may materialize. Um, but also just large municipal um, facilities can, can be very good. Uh, they've got a lot of space, a lot of parking, or they, um, in the more urban locations, would be on bus routes uh, or potentially even walkable locations from some neighborhoods. Uh, and um, with uh, that kind of size, you can better ensure that people are properly spacing when they come in, uh, distancing so that they're, they're not, be, areas are gonna be in a, 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 an exposure risk. Um, certainly we're gonna operate them in a way so that you book people and they won't um, be spending a lot of time at the facility. They come on time 
and hopefully not wait too long um, to be able to immunize and then go. So you keep the flow happening. We would certainly want one wave directional flow to be happening. So the, once again, large uh, municipal facilities can allow for that. They usually have multiple entrances. So anyway, those would be, uh, we do have from our municipalities a long list of such facilities. We've reached out to them all and they too will be key partners in all of this. Not happening yet. Toronto Star did one check in Northern Ontario that you know physical schools are open, but kind of testing is rarely happening. Yeah. Who's supposed to carry the ball on this? Is this the school boards or health unit or a combination of both? Because parents are asking, you know, if it's not being done, or if mm -hmm. it, when is it going to be done? Um, they're going to need our support for sure. But it, uh, in my mind, from what I'm reading, it's direction to schools, school boards via the Ministry of Education. A health unit is going to be a critical support in that, but um, the primary responsibility would be the school boards themselves. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, we'll go on to Adrian from MyFM. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I missed uh, part of the uh, meeting. I had to do the news. Um, so, sure if this was covered or not. Um, there seems to be uh, uh, quite a, a few number of new cases that are the UK variant. Mm -hmm. And because we seem to be ground zero, um, is there like a is there a rush being put on to getting vaccines for this area? It seems that other areas seem to be getting large amounts but mm -hmm. So thank you for the question, and certainly I would welcome us getting lots more vaccine. That would be very helpful. We have used the vaccine that we've received to focus on long-term care and retirement home residents in particular with the arrival of the UK variant, variants of concern, because, I mean, Roberta Place certainly was like a very stark example of what can happen, and uh, we need to do all that we can to protect people in facilities like that uh, and the vaccine is the, is the most protective thing we can do. So we're focused there with the vaccine we've had. We, we actually did receive some more vaccine when we positioned that to the province um, and positioned what we were doing uh, with that kind of focus. So um, although we didn't get communication specifying that that was the reason, we were happy to get it. Uh, and um, we can always use more, right? But right now we're focusing on uh, the, the people who are at greatest risk of all, which is the residents of those facilities. Um, I've communicated, we actually did ask for more. We indicated why. Um, you know, the, the kind of rationale that I've just given to you is what we gave, and we ended up actually getting more. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Dana Goldfinger from Global News, please. Are you still on, Dana? Okay, we'll go to Dawn Huddlestone from the Huntsville Doctor. You know what, this isn't, I'm, I'm afraid this is not ringing a bell. So um, I will inquire and I will get back to you. Thank you. Okay. And just a point of clarification on outbreaks, if you don't mind. Um, if employees at a workplace live in another area within Simcoe, Muskoka, are they included in the case count at least on the um, we, um, 
we hate we we have individuals we have outbreaks in Simcoe Muskoka and that's what we report we also report individuals who are part of an outbreak out of Simcoe Muskoka but live in Simcoe Muskoka and in my uh, verbal updates I will speak to uh, individuals who are part of an outbreak here but live out of district. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So usually there's a quite a lag uh, between the on, you know after the onset of uh, being a case being identified of, uh, as a case deterioration and then death and so um, usually it's quite a bit after the the onset of the last case that you get your final final deaths happening. So it's a minority, uh, and the reason for that is uh, because they are well into outbreak and most of them were already cases before we were able to arrive and provide immunization. And um, just looking to see if I can find the exact number. If I can't find it, I'll just get back to you with it. But, but um, it, it, like I said, it, it was a minority and uh, unfortunately it was too late. It was too late to make a difference. They, they, the vaccine takes with the first dose really in the range of two weeks before it shows a benefit. And if you're going in during an outbreak and immunizing people, you, you, it, you may not actually be achieving benefit because of the timing. Thank you. You're welcome. Like I said, we'll get back to you with the uh, specific number. Thank you for the question. We're receiving Pfizer vaccine to date. We haven't received any Moderna vaccine. And by all indications, we're not gonna get any Moderna for some time to come, certainly not in February. Uh, we do anticipate continuing to get about the same quantity of Pfizer we've been getting through February. And so our plans as to um, you know who, who we would prioritize to get vaccine are based on that. We anticipate getting much more in March, and so we want those uh, mass vaccination clinics up and able to run early in March, you know, possibly the first of March, um, to, be, to be able to take full advantage of that. But in the end, uh, you know, we, we found that you can't be certain about these things, that there's some unpredictability about it. The six regions? Okay, so it'd be Barry, South Simcoe, South Georgian Bay, North Simcoe, Aurelia, um, and uh, uh, Muskoka. Thank you. 
for the variant in the UK test, and it, uh, I was wondering if you could touch on that process mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more because it is a, a quite fascinating. My understanding from Public Health Ontario is that from February 3rd onward, they have been screening all COVID positive cases for the mutation that would indicate that they may have a variant. And then any that screen positive are um, given a, a genetic sequencing to determine which variant. That's a good question. Uh, my, my, my understanding is that Public Health Ontario would be arranging for that screening to be done on all of those results. Okay. I, I, um, just to go back to the question that I had before about the percent of uh, residents at Roberta Place that, or, that have been immunized, we've got 46% of the residents that have received their first dose of immunization and 5% um, that have received their second dose. So we'd be going back in time to give them, give them their second dose when it's time. So certainly, I've got an echo, just people could mute their lines, please. Okay. Um, certainly we want to make sure that people that have, they live in hot, the hard hit areas have access to vaccine immunization. We also want to make sure that um, uh, those that are most disadvantaged about this um, have good access to vaccines. So we know that uh, certain populations have had a disproportionate incidence of COVID-19 in our district. Those who live in neighborhoods where um, there's a high proportion of the population in which um, uh, their primary language is not English or French or belong to an ethnic minority group um, have carried almost half, represented almost half of the cases, right? And um, those populations are in fact concentrated in the southern portion of our territory. Um, and so most of our cases have been in the southern portion. So we want to make sure they have good access. We uh, will make sure that there's good access throughout Simca Muskoka. So we want at least one of these mass clinics in each of our districts, each of our areas. But there is the potential to have more than one, certainly. And I have no doubt that we'll have more than one in Barrie because it's, a, it's got the largest population and it's also had a very a large percentage of the cases. I think it would make sense for us to have more than one in South Simcoe as well, but I, but we need to see what um, opportunities come forward with the plans that, that get submitted to us tomorrow. And then beyond the mass immunization clinics themselves, there is the potential down the road if we if and when we get fridge stable vaccines such as AstraZeneca vaccine or the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Neither of those have been approved as yet, but we're expecting AstraZeneca to be approved soon by Health Canada. They're much easier to handle. There's a potential for those vaccines to be provided directly to primary care family practices and to pharmacies. And when you can do that, you'll have many more locations throughout all of our district, including in in South Simcoe and Barrie to, to uh, increase access, increase options for people. Okay, and uh, my other question is um, around enforcement with uh, Simcoe Muskoka moving into the red zone, is there a plan to increase enforcement to make sure that businesses are uh, following protocols? Well, certainly there was, okay, we got, got the echo again. Okay, thank you. Um, certainly there was a need for enforcement with the shutdown and with the stay-at-home order, so it, it's not that moving into red means it's 
more restrictive than it was before. It's less restrictive than it was before, but all the way through these stages, these um, color shifts that we've had, there's been a change in the rules, therefore a change in communication, a lot of orientation that we have to provide to businesses, a lot of calls that we get, and the potential for enforcement along the way. Um, enforcement tends to be a last step, uh, and we do have limited resources about it, so it's often complaint-based. Uh, the one exception being when we participated in the interministerial uh, enforcement blitz a week ago. But, um, you know, for the most part, it, for us, it's about communication and support. Thank you. You're welcome. In a sense, although the province's framework actually has that as a uh, um, baseline set of recommendations for all the color zones. That, uh, despite whatever color zone you're in, they're recommending that you stay at home and go out for essential purposes only and that you travel for essential purposes only. Yes, uh, I mean, it is no longer an order, though I had advised that it uh, should remain as an order. It's certainly going to be a clear, it's a clear position for everybody if it is an order, right? Uh, not being an order can be confusing to people if it's merely advisory, but that's the situation we're in. And so um, my position is to strongly advise that they abide by that advice, that they, in fact, behave as though it were still a stay-at-home order. That is confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, maybe I could restate it, but uh, I'm not sure how to make it clearer, I must admit. Bye, everybody.